everyone. How are you doing today? No, really, how are you? If you're anything like me, you might find it really hard to answer that question. Questions like, how's your day been? kind of send me into a panic. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just doing stuff and I've survived so far. So this is why the mental health check-in is so important. How many times do we dig ourselves into little holes surrounded by our worries, concerns, and current tasks and forget to kind of poke our nose up above the parapet and see the bigger picture? How are we actually feeling? especially if we're not feeling great. It's easier to know that something is wrong than to know exactly what is wrong. But before we go down any existential rabbit holes trying to find the answer, let's be practical. How can we be practical? We halt. Yep, halt. H-A-L-T. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. The four basics when you're thinking of your mental health. The four things you need to check to make sure you're taking care of yourself. We're going to go over them in this video. And because it's me, I've brought illustrations. By the way, I'm the art doctor, Nancy Langham Hooper. I'm a PhD art historian and cultural enthusiast ready to use the great art of the world to help you out. If you find this video helpful or entertaining, give it a big thumbs up. That will really help my channel grow. Okay, back to the check-in. The first thing you need to ask yourself when you're feeling off is, when did I last have something to eat? Hunger manifests in different ways at different times. Sometimes it's the classic rumbly tummy. Sometimes it's being a total insufferable jerk to everyone around you. But whether you're hangry or not, your mind and body will not be at their best if they're short on energy, which is what food is. But food is so much more than that too. It's culture, it's pleasure, and for some people, it's guilt. Hunger can be seen as a natural cue to eat, or a horrible vice to be tamed. So which is it? Let's ask Clara Peters. Clara Peters was an artist of the Dutch Golden Age. This gorgeous still life with cheeses, almonds, and pretzels was painted in about 1615. So what do we see? Three huge chunks of cheese on a plate with a dish of freshly made butter cut into beautiful curls sitting on the top. Those sausagey looking things in the foreground are indeed pretzels, and they sit next to an intricately carved knife on the side of which the artist has signed her name. Then we see a delicate Chinese porcelain bowl of figs and almonds. Behind that, a large decorated goblet of Venetian glass full of wine. It has a lid, as some goblets did at the time. Some fresh baked bread sits behind the goblet, and next to that, we have a brown jug with a bearded man's face called a Bartman jug, which holds, presumably, the rest of the wine. But there's another person in this jug. If we look carefully at the reflection on the metallic lid, we can see a tiny self-portrait of the artist. She looks hungry to me. So this is a celebration of bounty. In fact, this kind of still life is called a banquet in Dutch. The exotic porcelain and glassware show how international the Netherlands had become, and the feast reflects that. Figs and almonds, fresh butter and bread, three kinds of cheese, and pretzels, whatever those exotic German things are. And of course, wine. Enough wine to fill your glass and have a whole jug in reserve. This is the ultimate wine and cheese night. So food here is depicted as an everyday necessity, and an art unto itself, a pleasure and a celebration. And then there's Clara, peeking over it all, ready to consume her feast. There are all sorts of ways we can have toxic relationships with food, and it's such a shame. So the next time you realize you haven't eaten or are acting hangry, think of this little banquet. Anything simple that can nourish your body is worthy of celebration so don't forget to enjoy it. The next thing we need to ask ourselves if we're feeling off is, are we angry? Anger is one of the easier emotions to recognize. I mean, it makes itself known. But anger is actually a secondary emotion, meaning that it comes on the heels of another emotion. You might be angry, but first you may have been afraid, embarrassed, or hurt, for example. There are some models of the anger cycle that use fireworks as an analogy. The match is that triggering event. 
the primary emotion. You were taunted, judged, or hurt in some way. That lit the fuse. The fuse burns, whether long or short, and then suddenly the anger shoots up and explodes like a rocket. After the blast or the outburst of anger, you have a time of de-escalation, calming down to get back to your typical self. For me, nothing personifies anger more than James McNeil Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket. Yes, it's a painting of fireworks, the aftermath of a huge golden rocket crackling in the night, slowly descending and burning out. There are faint suggestions of people on the ground, but they seem almost less real than those golden sparks. This painting is melancholy, evocative, and totally characteristic of Whistler's work at the time, which sought to evoke mood through abstracting reality. But the real fireworks around this painting was the bitter legal battle Whistler fought with the haters, namely the renowned art critic John Ruskin. This is a fascinating story that I'll do another video on, but here are the basics. Whistler exhibited his Nocturne in Black and Gold at the Grosvenor Gallery in 1877. Ruskin saw it, thought it was awful, and wrote, I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear of a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. Back then, coxcomb was a hell of an insult. Whistler sued Ruskin for libel. The trial made loads of headlines before the highly unsatisfactory outcome. Whistler won his case, but was only awarded a farthing in damages. That's like less than a penny. Both plaintiff and defendant were bitter about this incident for the rest of their lives. If only they had understood fireworks. You don't get the flash bang without something lighting the fuse. They knew they were angry at each other, but they didn't appear to dig deeper. Whistler could have acknowledged that his feelings were deeply hurt by such a harsh critique from someone of Ruskin's status. And Ruskin could have admitted that he felt threatened by a new kind of art that didn't fit his preconceived ideas, and that he was afraid of losing his reputation. If only they'd use those quiet moments, when the sparks were dying out and falling to the earth, to check in with themselves and see what was really going on. The next step in HALT is to think about your personal connections and recent interactions. In short, are you lonely? So you already know, I assume, that we are social animals. We don't do well by ourselves for long periods of time. This is true for so-called introverts as well as for so-called extroverts. Though, of course, the need for alone time varies by person and life circumstance. But basically, we need people. And without them, we feel cut off. And here is probably the most beautiful depiction of being cut off that I've ever seen. This is a folio from a ragamela which is a kind of musical book entitled K. Maud Regini. It was done in the early 1770s and is a gorgeous example of Indian miniature painting. Now K. Maud is a woman who dresses up all fancy, makes a Pinterest-worthy bed of flower garlands in a secluded grove, and waits there for her lover. All of nature surrounds her. The paired up birds in the foreground looking at her curiously, the peacocks in the trees are presumably making quite a racket, and the flowers droop toward her bed as she waits. The halo around the Kamod's head suggests that this isn't just any woman, it's none other than the goddess Radha, awaiting her lover, the god Krishna. Except he's not shown up yet. And as the sky turns orange in the dawn, we realize that she's waited all night in vain. What this little painting is meant to express is viraha, that is, the pain of longing and separation. It's not just the pain of someone being absent, it's the pain of desiring closeness and being denied. This woman is ready for her lover. Everything has been prepared, everything is perfect, and yet he never shows up. Ouch. And though I don't suggest setting up a love nest in the woods as a dating or life strategy, we often feel that pain of viraha. There is an essential part of us that needs to connect to others. 
One of the things that a time of struggle can do is cut us off from other people. We don't have the energy to see anyone or go out, or we feel like we would be unacceptable to others in our current state, or perhaps we've decided that everyone has forgotten us. Viraha is there, that longing for contact, that longing for others. If you're lonely, don't wait for people to come find you. It's hard, but reach out. That's what Viraha is telling you to do. If you don't, you might be waiting all night. And did you even bring snacks, Radha? The final thing to check on our halt list is probably the most obvious, but it's certainly the most common. Tired. Are you tired? I can't see you, but I feel like a lot of you just nodded. I mean, I'm tired. I have a kid that thinks 2.30 a.m. is the perfect time to get up and play. And I have raging menopausal hormones that make me boiling hot one moment and exhausted the next. But we all know the solution to this one, right? Just get more sleep. <sighs> like it's that easy. And it's sleep's seeming simplicity, but actual complexity, we see in Vincent Desiderio's long, epic painting, Sleep. Twelve nude or semi-naked people sleep alongside each other. They're in pretty natural sleeping positions, with arms askew and mouths fallen open, all crammed together in a gigantic bed. Yet it seems they aren't really aware of each other. They aren't interacting at all. No one cuddles or holds hands. They are so naked, so vulnerable, yet they are so distant from each other. Desiderio shows us that sleep is the great leveler, our most human act, and one that no one can get by without for very long. Though we seemingly do it alone, we are a whole world of sleepers. We often boast about how tired we are, how hard we have worked, but how often do we boast about our sleep? Are we proud of our refreshment and rest, or are we ashamed of our human limitations? To be tired is to be human. To be human is to need to refresh. Let's not skip that part, all right? Well, I hope this helped you halt and check in with yourself when things get a little wobbly. Let me know how you go in the comments. And if you'd like to know more about Halt or about any of the paintings that we've seen today, I've left you lots of links in the description box below. All right, everyone, take care of yourselves, eat something good, examine your fireworks, reach out to your friends, and get as much sleep as you possibly can. You got this. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.